Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire Up with CJ show. Today we have Mary Mueller Shutan and we are talking about her book, The Body Diva, Working with Spiritual Consciousness of the Body. So welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me. Uh, I have to say this book really was divinely timed uh, because I uh, um, there are a couple of different um, practices that you talk about, all of which are ones that I follow, like the uh, sh Shaivism that you mentioned, yoga, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff in here is stuff that I practice. So it felt kind of miraculous that it was along the same <laughs> lines of something I practice. Um, and then uh, I just had this unbelievable meditation this morning with um, a gentleman that's called the heartfulness meditation. So I got this incredible meditation. So I'm all just, my heart was just been cleansed in the most fantastic way that I can imagine. Um, and so it, my body was just ready for all the questions that you have in the book. So um, I wanted to start for the beginning. Um, what is the body diva? You know, uh, when we're talking about devas, what we're really talking about is consciousness. We're talking about specifically, if we're talking about the the body deva, uh, we're talking about the the consciousness of the of the human form. So, mm -hmm. really, the intelligence of the human form. So, it's kind of an offshoot of intuition, but really, it's. Um, our body has so much, our physical body has so much wisdom and we kind of in the modern world lack the tools to now be able to tap into it. And so I'm all about bringing that sort of knowledge back and, you mm -hmm. know, it's so direly needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it seems like um, with all the practices now, you know, we have our little cell phone and we're like this and, you know, we're sitting at our desk like this, you know, there are all sorts of things that, um, I don't remember my body being in so much pain <laughs> than recently because of all the constant sitting and typing and it just seems like there's no relief to any of that kind of contraction. Yeah. And I mean, we've become so technologically oriented and so kind of, um, separated from the natural world that uh, really going into our bodies and really doing things like questioning internally, you know, self-reflection, those are all things that we have schism from to the point that we no longer have access to that type of knowledge. And so, yeah, bringing ourselves back to ourselves is such an important thing. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's a schism from that. That's a perfect way of describing it. And, um, it was interesting because you're, there are a couple of things that I really um, enjoyed, and many things that I enjoyed, um, but you're talking about um, um, like the chicken or the egg, right? What, what's the thing that precipitates the pain that we feel in our body? Is it the pain that we feel in our body, which then precipitates like a certain kind of emotional reaction or a, a trauma that then precipitates a whole? And, and, and you've, been, you've been really researching this for a while. What, what yeah. have you discovered? You know, uh, what I've really discovered is that we're just so much more complex than we give ourselves credit for. We're so much more complex, so much more multifaceted. And when we're healing, a lot of times what's presented in the mainstream are um, these really like kind of one for one ratios and these really simplistic notions of ourselves. And it's really if we have something, especially something complex going on, but even if we have something simple going on, we might have many patterns coming together. It might not just be one thing. It might be several things at once. And mm -hmm. so this book really teaches the skills of how to go into your body and discover everything from, oh, this is, you know, for me landing on my butt in a skiing accident right. to this is something from, um, you know, that needs karmic resolution or from a past life or ancestral, you know, it can be all of those things at once. And, right. um, that's how I've really discovered for my own healing path, as well as that of my clients, is how we really make huge leaps forward in our healing is that it's by discovering our complexity and, you know, kind of going pattern by pattern. Mm. And tell us about what you discovered about your own complexity and the patterns that you found when that kind of initiated this whole, you know, deep dive into understanding what was happening. Yeah, you know, I've always been uh, fairly sensitive, but when I started to get into my late teens and early 20s, I had um, what's known as a kundalini awakening, which mm -hmm. um, 
at the time if you know i was kind of joking with a friend the other day if you had told me oh there's such a thing as past lives it would have been like oh yeah sure you know right <laughs> that sort of thing and so um but what happened was that uh, during a spiritual awakening process, especially one that's um, pretty intense um, and that you don't have the background for, like a lot of people will do yoga for years and prepare their body. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have any of right. that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So all of this stuff came, started coming up, all of these patterns within myself. And so I really went searching for, education as well as my own healing process and I found a lot of great modalities and a lot of great methods that have really and a lot of great teachers that have really helped me on my way um, to be able to understand what was going on in my own process as well as eventually to be able to help others. So tell me a little bit about what modalities and uh, teachers you you use that were helpful along the way and what you learn from each of them. Well, I have a master's degree in Chinese medicine, and so mm -hmm. a lot of the Eastern modalities form the basis or background of um, of my knowledge. So a lot of the a lot of the principles that I use come from kind of a combination of uh, Taoist principles as well as um, things like spiritism and spiritualism. Mm -hmm. um, but my background is really, really informed by body work. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, craniosacral therapy is a huge one for me. Mm -hmm. um, zero balancing, uh, Reiki, just really, I could list off, you know, all of these different <laughs> modalities I've studied for the years, but cranial, cranial work is really one of the bigger ones because um, with its method of questioning, which is um, comes from spiritual methods, but also uh, gestalt and psychosynthesis, um, they really started me on the path of understanding the wisdom uh, of the of the body and how we can approach it in a way that isn't kind of like sh poking it with a stick, but it's mm -hmm. really seeking to kind of be in concert with it. Yeah, that sort. Of, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I've had um, over the last, I'd say, three years, I've been on a health odyssey that started with a recurring uh, plant, plantar fasciitis, and then uh. moved to a back pain back injury that was so bad that I couldn't walk for like a month and so my body was like okay time out I'm taking you out <laughs> until you figure out what the heck is happening and um and during the last three years I've used a combination of acupuncture um massage mm -hmm. PT cranial sacral chiropractic work going to the Western doctors. And um, I would say, sadly, the most frustrating was going to the Western doctors who were like, just put a, put something in your foot or get back surgery. And I was like, what? Yeah. So <laughs> You're lucky they didn't try to convince you to get an epidural or something. No, thank God they didn't. And thank God I didn't, I already had a leaning towards holistic medicine that I didn't go down that path. But I, I'm wondering for your own, because one of the things that you talk about in your book is that you talk about every single person having a unique pattern that's specific to them. So I don't know yeah. if this is an answerable question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so it was really hard to know which thing, you know, like I have, you know, eight variables of I mean, combinations of things. Oh, and Feldenkrais was the other thing. So I have like subtle movements and, and energy oriented stuff. Then I had like cracking your back and, you know, building your muscles. So there's mm -hmm. kind of foundational things. And I would say I would group them in two classes, foundational things, and then there is kind of just subtle energy, very, very subtle kind of work and retraining and rebuilding the foundations. How, how does one, do you have an advice or is it dependent on each person on that a, a rational way to approach all these different modalities out there? You know, um, it kind of depends on the person, but really if we were um, to look at ourselves as having, you know, a couple of different layers. So we have a physical layer, then we have a mental emotional layer, and then we have a spiritual layer. Um, for something that's really complex, we really need something that approaches all of those different layers. And so getting something that's more physically oriented, such as a massage or something that approaches the physical layers of the body, as well as looking at 
through like the body deva or other work, um, something that approaches the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of things. I think that they're all indicated, especially mm-hmm. when we have something going on that's chronic or hasn't responded to Western medicine or hasn't even responded to kind of holistic medicine. Mm -hmm. I really think that looking at all of those layers is important. But in terms of what to go for first, I always suggest people go um, towards what is the most out of balance or what's the most distressing Mm -hmm. to them. So if it's the physical body, you know, if you, I kind of joke, but Mm -hmm. it's like, if your appendix bursts, you don't need a shaman, you need, you know, you (laughs) you an ER doctor, you know, like, right. <laughs> please bringing my spirit guides to help my yeah. appendix. I mean, call them in or whatever, but yeah. you know, like after you get the appendix out, then maybe consider, you know, the karma or the diet or, you know, whatever's going on. And it's wonderful that a lot of modalities kind of cross boundaries that are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, but sometimes, um, we need something that might focus on one of those layers more than another. Um, For me, for instance, I'm a really sensitive person. And so uh, when I got acupuncture initially, my physical body was out of balance to the point that it was kind of um, difficult for me to receive it because it was pretty intense for me, that sort of energy moving. So I needed something that was more nurturing for me, something Mm. to more build me up. And so um, herbalism and Reiki and, you know, cranial work were, were perfect for that. But Mm. now I can, you know, get acupuncture and, and it's fine or even massage or, you know, something like Rolfing or, you know, that's really, well, that's really intense. Yeah. (laughs) The intense body work I actually like now. (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, so you're almost built kind of depends on where, what's happening. I love that answer because for me, what it's all, it's been an intuitive journey where like I thought, yeah, this isn't working anymore, I think. And I literally hear something intuitively in my head, like go for cranial sacral, which I didn't really even know what cranial sacral was. Yeah, that happened to me before I started studying it. I signed up for a workshop and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> so, you know, that small voice is important to listen to. And bringing it back to the body, Dave, I, I'll say that Uh, Some people have responded to me saying that when you cultivate this relationship with the intelligence of the body, they've been surprised to hear, hey, you need a dietitian or, you know, something like that. You need to go see a doctor, sort of, you know, a Western medicine doctor that and it's, you know, important. Again, we've kind of schismed. And so some people will try to negate Western medicine. But you know, we are so multi-layered, so, so complex. It's really about getting the right standard of care and um, having an ally like the body deva can help to guide you to um, the correct resources or at least sort of, you know, kind of bring you, bring you a bit closer to them. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, and there's so many different ways now. So I have a girlfriend who, who is trying psychedelics and that's one methodology, right? And there's, and she's tried, um, and she's been very resistant to trying any of these things. And then she got um, a steroid shot, which she really doesn't want to do anything unnatural. But it reached a point where it was the most practical thing to do. And she didn't really want to do it. But frankly, she's done it and her health has improved very dramatically. So it's it's a very interesting, I think it's interesting to think about the schism that you refer to because it, it does go both ways. You know, so there's sometimes Western medicine is the best answer and you know, we're resistant to try it. Like some shot is, could be better than, you know, a hundred Reiki sessions, you know, for a person, especially when they've tried it and they've got, they've hit a certain juncture. Yeah. And I mean, uh, what I will say is that in my field, I do a lot of spiritual work and spiritual teaching. And sometimes people really need counseling. They need somebody to talk to. And so, um, that's always kind of a hard sell for some people, but it's like, yeah, we, we in our culture really look down on mental health and we need to be physically healthy, mentally, emotional, healthy, and spiritually healthy. And if there's resistance towards any of those layers there, that's really something to look at. Like for a long time, I was pretty physically resistant. I'm definitely not the marathon right. <laughs> type. And so, you know, through using resources like this, I've been able to look at, okay, what exactly is preventing me from wanting to do yoga, from wanting to get physically healthy, from wanting to, you know, eat correctly, all of that sort of stuff. So 
um, you know, kind of looking at that sort of thing uh, and what is creating the most imbalance in our lives um, really is the way that we can make leaps and bounds in our own process. Yeah, it's, um, so I, I wanted to, um, I actually have done, um, went through your whole book um, and <laughs> went through it from beginning all the way. And, and literally, as I, it was really amazing. I went through it and almost every single chapter was appropriate for for the next step, which I think is makes sense. That's why you wrote the book in this order. <laughs> no you surprise. Know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a very pragmatic person, you know, the way that my, I kind of joke about the way that my brain works sometimes, but it mm-hmm. very much takes complex subjects and it tries to break them down into kind of the simplest way of describing them. And so, yeah, I mean, the book is, it's really pretty simple. It's like, okay, let's introduce you to the resource that is the spiritual consciousness of the body or, you know, the physical form. But here are all the different ways that you can approach it. Here are all the different things that you can know. Here are all the different questions that you can ask to really sort of dig in. Yeah. And so the first was just <clears throat> kind of a, a, an initial investigation, identifying resistance and blocks and then working with emotions, of which um, <clears throat> I've already done some of this stuff already. So if it seems like, wow, is it happening this quickly all the time? I, I spent a couple hours with this book going through it. So don't exp- it may you may or may not have the same results at home. But I thought I'd share. Maybe you can actually step me through. And who knows if I'll come up with the same answers as before. But my neck, has I've had a chronic neck problem where I can't turn fully in both directions. It's like here and then... Um, and then here, and then it's attached to my jaw, and then it's attached to my lower back, um, right around the sacral area on both sides, my okay. left knee, and then it goes, so it's kind of a zigzag from this all the way down, this, this all the way to my back, and then goes to my foot um, on the left ankle, and then crosses over to the right ankle. And so it's this kind of snaking pattern that snakes throughout my whole body. Um, so that's, that's what's been coming up. And, and the recent acupuncturist, she said something interesting that I wanted to get your opinion on. She said, you know, you're at this juncture where your body is trying to like kick into resonance energetically. And like, you're at the point, her intuitive sense was that you're at the point where, you know, what goes in, what traumas go in must come out the same (laughs) same it must come out in some way and I'm kind of at the you know the bottom of the whip you know where it kind of went in and then mm-hmm. it's like snapping out that was her intuitive um thought so I, I was riffing off of that but um yeah. yeah maybe you can guide me based on your book and like what so people have a flavor of the types of things in the book Sure. I mean, you've already described a bit of the pattern, but what I generally do is have people focus on, um, it can really be anything. It's just kind of a window in. It could be a physical pain. It could be an emotion. It could be a belief. It could be even something like um, career or, you know, financial success or or whatever is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, The understanding is we're approaching it through the physical body and by going physically, Um, By anchoring it in the physical body, that means that all of the layers, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual can be healed, which results in the the greatest amount of healing. But generally what I'd have you do is to, you know, kind of basically tell me a little bit about your neck pain, which you've already done. But with such a big pattern, what I'd have you do is just to go in and get a sense of your body if it has any sort of focal um focal yeah it's point. right it's right here in my throat yeah. it's a it's kind of a and you had described in the book to describe well i'll let you go to walk me through yeah this sorry <laughs> you like my questions no, sorry I'm, just... I'm not gonna take your questions but yeah now that you found my the focal point what i'd like for you to do is just to physically describe to me what you're what you're sensing there yeah it feels like um it feels like a like a spherical ball like about this big like a tennis ball and then it kind of attaches down to um, right around like two inches above my belly button. And uh, and then a little bit in my third eye. There's just, it just feels like there's a connection to my belly button. And then in my mm-hmm. third eye, there's um, kind of like a little knot. Okay. Yeah, that's what it feels and like. And so if we go back to that focal point, that kind of tennis ball sort of sensation, mm-hmm. 
just describe it to me a little bit more. Like, is there a particular color or is there anything that you can describe to me of how, how it looks? Yeah, it's kind of calcitrant. Like if I were to describe it, it's almost like a, you know, when things calcify, like maybe plaque on your teeth, that kind of thing. It's kind of like that. It's like a calcified, hard kind of resistant surface with a little, like little triangular spheres, like little, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I'd like for you to go into that kind of tennis ball with the little spheres and just ask it what it is doing there. Um, it's saying that it is protecting me from um, feeling uh, uh feeling pain and speaking my truth okay so it's protecting you right so let's get a little bit more information of what would happen if it wasn't there okay oh then i'd have to feel it in my stomach like if this weren't here i'd have to feel the pain in my stomach which is there's mm -hmm. kind of a like a kind of like kind of a twisting in my stomach Okay, so there's that twisting in your stomach that you'd have to feel. And I'm wondering, just like kind of chatting with you here, is that if it would be okay if you were to feel that stomach pain? Yeah, and it feels like it's two directions. It's kind of, there's a twist and then there's a cap, like there's a floor that goes like, mm -mm, not going any further. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, what was your question again? What would it feel like if I were to go into it? Okay, which one? Just this one or both? Say, I'm asking, like, we can make conscious decisions when mm -hmm. we hear what's going on. You know, it's protecting you, but it's doing this in a subconscious way. You're not an active, really an active participant in this right now. It's making decisions for you. Right. And it may feel like it's doing it for your own good, but... Really, it's a question of this is creating difficulty in your life. And so would it be okay if your your stomach, um, if we were to go into your stomach or if this were to change or, you know. Yeah, okay. Got whatever. it. Okay, so I go into my stomach and I'll go slightly, I'll just touch base with my stomach and my third eye. Yeah. Um, so my stomach doesn't want me to feel um, just grief. Okay. Grief and sadness and um kind of a, a out of controlness and uh, my this area over here feels like if I let it go then I have to let go of the memories and I don't there's a part of me that wants to remember all the memories for some reason it's uh, in your book you would call it an obstacle of some sort or fear and block <laughs> Yeah. So what happens is that we develop these beliefs that um, in order to remember things that we have to keep the pain. And that isn't true. We can remember things, but we don't need to hold on to the remnants of them in our physical bodies. And so if we were to drop into that solar plexus area, into that sort of grief and need for control, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we check in and ask how long that has been there. It's, uh, it? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, um, you talk about past lives. This is a karmic thing that's been there for many, many lives. It's a, okay. it's a big pattern. I think you, uh, maybe you can introduce the idea of a soul contract. I think that this is that yeah. idea. So, um, what I would say is that if, um, a lot of times when we're healing, we have a lot of stuff come up from, you know, from our own timeline, but we also can have past lives come up, karma come up ancestral energies come up even cultural um, and archetypal energies come up even you know I get to some really complex stuff but it's like even some mythic aspects or you know I call it the multitude of selves but we might have part aspects of ourselves that kind of feel like they're um, in conflict with one another and yes. so um, that's it bing bing yeah <laughs> I would and, say that yeah the, and I would say just to can I or yeah, sorry. Go ahead. yeah, so I would say that um, as I was contemplating this, it's um, part karmic where it feels like when I have investigated past lives, there have been many instances where I wanted something to happen a certain way. And so mm -hmm. I would push against the authority at hand, whether it was the church or parents or a town or whatever. That was kind of my way of being. I'm going to push my way through and with power and control um, make something happen that I think is the right thing to happen. 
So there's that thing, which is this karmic pattern that I've had for a really long time, coupled with, uh, I would say, a Chinese heritage, which is about girls should not be heard. The only They should not be heard or seen. Your only role in life is to sit in the background behind your man, your brother, your husband, whatever man there is, you're supposed to sit in back and just yeah. shut up. Bind your feet, shut up, just yeah. do what they want. It's like, okay, I have no choices or no control over my life because there's already a built-in program that I cannot break. So it's, yeah. yeah. And so we, again, are going to like, here's a pattern that's about control and it has many different facets to mm-hmm. it. And really people can go for decades looking to feel some of this stuff and never really be like, oh, this is because of my heritage or something like that. But let's kind of go for the past life angle today. Sure, yeah. Ordinarily, what I'd have people do is to check in to see if it the past life is resonant. And what that means is that if you ask your solar plexus, is this a past life, there should be a sense of some sort of heightening or like kind of that internal sense of knowing of, yes, this is a past life or this would be a good avenue to pursue. Yeah. So um, what is um, coming up for me is yes. And there's just like this huge amount of fury and rage, just fury and rage and anger and just like a chaotic storm of emotions. Yeah. And so when we have, when we're going for something that's a bit more complex or that's been through many past lives is this, um, in the book, I kind of compare it to a snowball rolling down the hill. What we really want to do is go towards who started this. How did that snowball start at the, at the beginning of the hill? Because it creates, you know, when that snowball rolls down the hill, it goes through all those past lives and starts to pick up snow, but it carries that belief and the energies and the trauma forward. And so what I'd like for you to do is to go into your solar plexus and ask who this originated with and ask for them to step forward. <laughs> okay. When I do that, um, uh, I, my conscious mind wanted to say myself, but really what mm-hmm. happened was God stepped forward. And God's like, oh. okay, me. Okay. <laughs> I'm the one that made let's, all these things happen. Okay. So let's like maybe like make that a little tiny bit smaller and say within your trajectory of your past lives in terms of your your karma, um, in terms of your past lives, let's hook into who the originator, who started this pattern. Uh, okay, in the past lives. I think that yeah. – um, I think that there were a set of circumstances where I feel out of control, like life is happening to me, Mm -hmm. which I think is through God's unfolding of itself, right? So God is unfolding itself, but I created the pattern because instead of saying, oh, God is unfolding itself, let's see where this miraculous flower will blossom to. I'm like, oh, no, you don't. Let me prune you and cut you and like put some fertilizer on it and, you know, like all that stuff. So, it, so yeah. that, that's, that's basically what happens for me. Yeah. And so you have a good idea about the energetics or the patterning here. And so mm-hmm. I'd like for you to go into your solar plexus. And this is really the difference between you know, kind of information coming from our body versus, you know, kind of our minds or or what we've already established is that if you go to your solar plexus and ask for the male or female to step forward, that past life who started this, I'm curious what they look like. It's a female and it's a woman Mm -hmm. and she's kind of a warrior fighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so take a look around and get a sense of like, if you were to describe where she is or what's going on around her, what would you? <laughs> she's on the battlefield and she's just decimated lots and lots of people in her intention to create some positive outcome. Okay. Yeah. And so we don't need to necessarily, you know, have a whole story here, but we do need to get a sense of What is going on as in what has been traumatic for her? Um, um, Not having her uh, feeling, oh, two things, not losing her connection with God. So in some ways, 
she abandoned, I think it's when she felt like, I don't understand what God is doing here. So I'm just going to abandon God. And in that fracturing of the connection with God, I think there is just this deep sense of loss that happened as a result. Yeah, and so let's backtrack just a little bit because you hit on the belief perfectly, but yeah. let's get a let's get a what caused for that belief to happen? Like uh what caused when well, my expectations of what I thought was supposed to happen did not get met. What I okay. personally my ego thought was the right thing did not get met. Okay. And so let's go let's go into her and like as if we were watching her on a TV screen. Let's see mm -hmm. that play out just a little bit to ground that into her lifetime. So what event happened that caused for her for this, again, using that word schism, for that schism from, from God? Okay, the one that's coming up of my past lives is this one woman who was part of a wealthy family. And she noticed how um, uh, the townspeople were not had a grain store that was actually pretty sizable and could have fed the poor and townspeople, but they were restricting that food. And so she was really mad and she opened up the corn stores for all the people to take, uh, to, to be fed. Um, and then as a result, she was whisked away one night and buried alive. Okay. Okay, and so if we go back to this warrior woman and get mm -hmm. a sense of what event may have transpired for her, I'm curious um, there. Yeah, well, I, I just, um, I have, um, I never had, but recently, I think over the last, I don't know, ever since discovering this past life, I don't like being in closed spaces. So even the thought of being in a closed space where I can't get out, is kind of a anxiety producing type of thing, which I didn't have before. Yeah, and so sometimes things come up that are really emotional or they can create a heightened response of, in us. And so I do teach how to kind of look at things as if they're on a television screen. So yeah. if you picture a blank TV screen in front of you and you turn it on and you see this warrior woman, and so we already know the belief here, which is the important Mm -hmm. aspect of things we just need to backtrack a little bit to find out what happened to her to um, create that belief yeah I think that what happened to her is that she was defying the authorities at hand and she didn't really fully understand the full picture of why the church or whomever was not or townspeople were not releasing the food and so she took it on her own in this kind of radical movement to free the people and it was um somewhat of an ill-founded idea i think to okay. save people i was she was trying to save people but it really didn't save anyone okay so she was trying to save people she was trying to do the right thing and she didn't have kind of a, an idea fully of what was going on and right. so um what belief was created um out of this you've already touched on it but Let's kind of check in with her. Uh, I see. Okay, yeah, the, uh, you have to do more. It's just, you just didn't do enough. You yeah. weren't enough. You didn't do enough. Next time, be better prepared. Be, mm -hmm. do more to control the situation. You just let things get yeah. out of hand. So actually, instead of like letting go, she moved to actually having more control and restriction and like tightening up everything and not mm -hmm. responding to God's voice. Her, she yeah. wasn't responding to her body diva. She was just responding to her egoic voice, which was, I, this is what it needs to look like, and I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, so here's somebody who may have felt like she was being led, and so that didn't work out. And so she's like, okay, now let's be in control. Let's contract. Let's listen to that sort of egoic voice. Let's really be in control here. And so, again, we get back to that idea of control and let's um, just ask her, we've already touched on this, but I really want to, what's really important here are the beliefs. And so let's ask her about that belief regarding control. You must control things to have the best possible outcome. Mm -hmm. And what happens if she doesn't control things? Then chaos will ensue and okay. people will be at risk, including yourself. Okay. And so with any past life or ancestral work, I now track back into the current lifetime and see how that belief transpires for you. So you may have taken that on directly, 
or you may have changed or shifted that, but consider your own ideas regarding control and kind of drop into that solar plexus area. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, yeah, the, the two things that came up for me, and again, this is all stuff we're, we're going through this really rapidly. This took me yeah, hours yeah. to come through, but, and just so yeah. that people aren't like, is this how fast it usually goes? You know, no, <laughs> but, it is. Yeah. but for me, what came up was, um, I realized that my dad kept on smoking cigarettes I asked him several times to stop. He literally had died of a heart attack because he just wouldn't stop smoking cigarettes. And so that was one thing that occurred. And so I feel like, oh, I, I should have done more to help him or be part of his life or to love him more. I had to do something. So then now fast forward to my own children. So now they have opportunities in their life where I want to do as much as I can to basically offer them the best opportunities to do everything possible thing I can do yeah. to control their lives so that they can have the very best possible outcomes and so I can see that's basically a remnant from from that's how yeah. it controls me in this current life yeah and so we can see how you've taken that snowball you know and how it's rolled downhill and how it's transpired in your own life and so there's a question here one of my teachers used to always ask it it was kind of a half joking way but it's like if you go into that solar plexus and you ask how how is that working for you to yeah. try to make control over everything? What would the yeah, um, uh, what came up was um, an email that I sent my son because we were arguing about when to write college apps, and I finally got to the point that I thought, you know what, my um, job, and it's not even really my job, what I want to do is offer you as many opportunities as possible. You're your job or responsibility is to either take these opportunities or not take these opportunities. And, and then it's only you who can create your path. I cannot make you do these things, which in my eldest son, I was trying to make him do stuff. And I just realized I can't make him do any of this. He has to own it. And I give up. So I said, I give up. <laughs> I'm not going to fight you anymore about this. But yeah. also you have to understand you own this. I don't own this. The only thing that I feel like on my side I'm going to do is offer you opportunities. You can deny them and also live with the consequences or you can accept them and live with the consequences. But I'm done trying to make you do anything. I'm, the fighting hurts me and it hurts you and I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, and what's more is that that clamping down, that control, it yeah. doesn't work and, you know, um, or it may work, but it only works in the short term. And, you know, you never are able to get exactly that outcome or that perfect level of control, right? Yep. And so we can, with this awareness, we can start to see that the pattern didn't start from you. It started from this past life. And now we can go back to that past life, to that warrior who um, decided to make this decision or belief that she was going to focus kind of and clamp down and control everything. And again, it's that same sort of question of how did that work for her? Well, she got killed in every single, there are many past lives of which I'm burned at the stake, killed, buried alive, yeah. like every single time I die. And then not only do I die, but oftentimes I put the risk, my family at risk too. Because it's mm -hmm. just like a whole package deal where I won't do something. And so they, you know, basically try to kill my family. So it's, yeah, it hasn't worked it, out well. Yeah, <laughs> that's, past that's life I've been in. You know, that's the thing about when we're talking about karma, you know, especially things that have transpired over a long period of time is that it's the same actions. You know, they can sort of flip flop a bit, but it's the same thing that's happening again and again. And so it's really that question of how is this working for you? But not, not only that, but when we have perspective like this, when we're looking at a situation instead of involved with it, we can offer another way. And right. so for somebody, I talk about this in the book, the notion of a good death, like I, ideally we'll have a death where we're prepared for death and, you know, it happens in a manner that we're ready for, that we're conscious with. And so if we go to her and offer her a way to reconnect to let go of control and for that sort of perspective now i'm wondering what she would say well um a couple things one is that i, I think we it's an illusion that we have any control period it's kind yeah. of an illusion so I, I think that's one 
really there's a master plan of which I have no control over. There's some greater, higher force, whether you call it the universe, the God, the body, Deva, like whatever you call it, yeah. there's some greater force that has some intelligence that is greater than my own limited intelligence and perspective on what the right thing to do is. Yeah, and so you realize that, and you realize this in this lifetime, but that may have taken you uh, a bit of time to get to. And so yeah. if we go back to this past life, and, you know, when we're wounded, you know, there is this um, thought in, you know, Zen of like obscured clarity, essentially, is that when we're wounded, when we're away from realizing that intelligence, when we're away from that, we try to control, we try to rule over, we get arrogant, we get, you know, ego, all of that sort of stuff. And so this is a woman that was responding to trauma, basically. And so she, you know, moved further away from that clarity, moved further away from wholeness. And so it's a question of, if she's ready to move forward into that wholeness and sort of break or heal this, heal this karma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because when I was thinking about um, this, I, I think that it, uh, two things happen. One is I feel like when this happened, I had, you talk about in your book about a loop where you, you, mm, yeah. something is not resolved. So you go in this infinite loop and then it kind of builds on each other. And it's, you know, lifetime after lifetime, I've had this loop that yeah. I'm trying to resolve and get the answer for. And then this lifetime, it's like, ah, I hope this lifetime, but you know, I, you have like some type of, <laughs> At aha. Least closer, yeah. yeah, I'm like, I'm circling in. Okay. You're like, I'm getting closer yeah. and closer, but I'm circling in. And I realize that, you know, I think that I would have been safer. My family would have been safer. Um, and that there's some greater intelligence that is feeding information to all of us. And it would be better had I not let go of that intelligence and abandon it, which I think I did. At some age, I was like, yeah, forget it. This is clearly not working based on this world. So I'm just going to abandon the universe, God, whatever. And I would say the last three years has been um, having this um, – devotion to finding uh, devotion and love to finding that back because it's about responding to life versus just yeah. reacting yeah exactly and it's about living life instead of being in these you know repeated loops and so yeah. but if we it sounds like you've done a tremendous amount of work which is why we're able to go through this so quickly and again yeah. the book goes through kind of step by step of things and you know, past lives don't necessarily come first for people. Usually it's our own childhood. So I just right. like to remind people of that. But if we go back to this woman, you have your consciousness now, but there is an aspect of you that feels divided. There's an aspect of yourself in your solar plexus that feels divided. That is this woman that decided to turn her back on God, essentially, that she'd rather have or for whatever reason needed that control. And so it's a question to her, not necessarily to your present day consciousness of what would she need to be willing to see with clarity what's going on and allow for her to reconnect again. Yeah. So when I did do this, interestingly, it was um, in your book, you have a couple of different concepts. One is um, um, healing in utero and working with, uh, I think, uh, your inner child. And I would mm -hmm. say that... Um, two things happened. Um, one is at birth, I didn't really feel safe or wanted, which I think yeah. was definitely the case with my family. And, and that's okay. Like, you know, I don't, I think I was kind of like, oh, whoops, surprise. Oh, no. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> that kind of baby. Yeah. So, so that and, happened. And, that happened. Yeah. And then I think at age six, um, I, there was actually this movie of me when I was like around six, and I was dancing around with the universe. I, I actually even remember where it was like, I was just dancing to, and there wasn't even music. I could just feel the music. And so like yourself, I was a really highly sensitive person and dancing and I could just feel I was one with everything. And then slowly, and I don't remember when, but around that age, um, you know, mm -hmm. my, the things that I thought were beautiful or beautiful about me were never recognized as, um, as a little girl. And I think that that 
that was when I was like, oh, I guess there's some other rules here that I need to know about. I can't be dancing to the universe in this blissful state. <laughs> so I think that that's when at age, I don't know, probably six to six to 16 that I'm like, okay, I guess I just have to be corporate CJ because that's the only way I'm going to get love in this family. So it was actually out of a desire for love that and not getting it using that other path. That's That was when I let go, I think at birth yeah. and then at that other stage. So as we can see, like a lot of these patterns are really multifaceted and like have a lot of different um, things that we need to heal. And so people always want for that, you know, they always want that kind of, I jokingly call it Michael Bay healing. They want that one, you know, <laughs> explosive thing and then to be done with everything. And that's <laughs> right. not- I'm done. Woo. I'm, I'm yeah, like one with God now. Works that we have a lot of different layers to our patterns and that's why in the book I do go over in utero in utero healing or you know our first breath, and especially if I were to talk about in utero healing, what I would say is that um, pre and perinatal sort of healing is such a huge area of unhealed energies for people, and it really doesn't get the the popular consciousness that mm-hmm. it really deserves. It's such. There are so many people walking around that feel not wanted, not a part of this earth. And, you know, I run across people all every day that, you know, um, and, I, and I'm very compassionate to them, but it's like, you know, rainbow moonbeam, you know, that sort right. of thing, you know, right. and it's like, I'm secretly a fairy shaman unicorn, you know, right. and it's like people are where they are, but it's like, what is preventing you from being in this reality, uh, from yes. being in this reality and that will actually allow for you to become more, quote unquote, spiritual if mm. you're able to really become a part of this reality, you know. Um, and so a lot of times it has a root in very early childhood and in utero. Um, and those aren't areas that are tended to well by psychology because they're pre-verbal, you know. Right. Like, and I don't remember um, what it was like in birth, but a yeah. part of me does. <laughs> yeah, we still have that consciousness within us. And what happens when we experience any level of trauma is like, it's like that aspect of ourselves freezes. And um, ideally, in a lot of the the work that I do, um, this idea that we are consciousness, and if we are in our full consciousness or in in an awake or an enlightened state, that means that we're in full flow. So we have that full state of consciousness. And it's like all of these static pieces of consciousness are all the little traumas from past lives from in utero from when we were six from all of these different sources and if we're able to resolve them and heal them then we're in more of a flowing state more of a present state more of a conscious state Mm. so um people often ask me why i wrote this book beyond having my own healing path and it's like well going through a spiritual awakening what it really is is looking inward looking at your own suffering, seeing what is held within you, what's static within you, because it's going to, you know, it's going to come up whether you want it to or not. So, you know, here are some tools to resolve it. I mean, obviously, the book is for everyone, but particularly with my interest in kind of spiritual topics um, that kind of led me there. But yeah, and so we have this pattern for you that has so many different dimensions. And so it's like, if you were able to heal that past life and get her to the point of being like, you know what, I would, I'm ready to reconnect again. That means that then it's like you've resolved the bottom of the ocean. And then Mm -hmm. let's go to mid ocean where it's Mm -hmm. your in utero, then it's cultural healing. And then it's um, early childhood. And then it's you today. And by resolving all of those layers, eventually that ocean, you know, heals and you no longer feel that schism or that conflict within yourself that, Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, there's this aspect of me that feels like I'm holding myself back from God or feels that like it needs to, that I need to control everything around me or has anxiety or grief about that anymore. So, yeah. So I'm going to um, try to do a wrap up because we've covered the whole universe. We've, I've literally tried it somehow. <laughs> I have no idea how this happened, but again, there is some greater consciousness even controlling this interview. So I had a great, huge opening. And then um, what we did is we talked about the, this intelligence, the deva, body deva within us that has this intelligence and that it, it has patterns that we were talking about, like how it was arced throughout my body. And yeah. then resistance and blocks, right? I had a block 
uh, and you have a chapter um, working with resistance and blocks because oftentimes, yeah. like I had a resistance or block in my third eye, third eye and my my solar plexus. So we talked about that. We went into the fear and emotions, and for me, it was about control and and what's in the book, which I think is just so beautiful and wonderful. Are all the questions? So you have a list of questions. So if you wanted to on your own at least start exploring these things to kind of assess it out you could do some of your pre-work beforehand and uh Mm -hmm. yeah working with your fear and emotions and then we talked about working with your inner child which was that six-year-old version of me who just like I'm out of like I'm out of here this clearly whatever (laughs) this is working is not working and then we talked about contracts, which I feel like this this karmic contract, which I've been playing over and over again about I'm going to save the world, you know, super not helpful and not even true. Um, so I see that as that. And then healing in utero is what we just spoke about. Um, mm-hmm. And then we also talked about healing family and ancestry, which is this has very uh, deep roots in my Chinese uh, heritage, for sure. Yeah. In healing culture with that too we don't yeah. give a lot of, yeah, there's been kind of a renaissance of people talking about ancestral healing of it but yes really for sure also focus on cultural healing as well because that's that's a biggie for people so yeah and then there's healing past lives which is what this whole thing initiated with so um so we basically hit with this one example every <laughs> chapter in your oh, book we did. Uh, so thanks for choosing a really complex pattern yeah but it shows really you know how complex that we are and especially you know you could be somebody who is just starting out and you know who is like oh i'd like to have a little bit of a mind body connection or somebody that you know has been meditating for 20 years and still there are a lot of you know tools in there and that's really the purpose of all my books is like i don't hold anything back you know i give all the tools i give all of the questions so you can really do this for yourself and really do this with depth and really approaching your complexity. So, and so if people wanted to work with you or learn more about this process, do you have classes or can people work with you one-on-one? Tell us about your website and how they could work with you to do the same kind of work. You can go to maryshutan.com. Um, I am teaching some online courses right now. Um, mm-hmm. That's M-A-R-Y-S-H-U-T-A-N.com. Um, I teach online courses right now. Um, I have stepped away from my personal healing practice to focus on writing because um, that's the way that I can reach the most amount of people. But I do have a couple of practitioners that do the body deva work um, via distance, via Skype or phone. And that's really wonderful. Um, As well as um, I teach a variety of courses that you can check out and you know do a blog and all that sort of stuff that you need to do nowadays. right <laughs> so mary i think everyone can figure out but shutan is s-h-u-t-a-n.com so we can get your video work we can work with some of the folks that actually are the people that you work with that help people step them through this process and yeah. of course get the book right that's kind of yeah. a good entry point um thank you so much for being yeah. here you for having me. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.